What's going on, it's the Polygon Don, and today I'll be discussing five more underrated PS4 games from my collection, whether they were well received but not played by any gamers, or unfairly treated in a critical sense, I talk about why you might want to give them a shot and consider them for your own collections. So with all that said, let's get into it. Perhaps I'm the last living soul here, although I'm far from alone. This is not my story, although I am the architect of what transpires. A conspirator in the ruination that threatens the heretic kingdoms. And the most unlikely of alliances that might yet save us all. Shadows Awakening by Slovakian studio Games Farm is an isometric top-down action role-playing game in a similar vein to games like Diablo. Released in 2018 for PS4, Xbox One and PC, it received generally favourable reviews at the time of release, but the sheer lack of awareness of the game from people I ask is the reason I'm including it here today. The third instalment of the PC-based Heretic Kingdom series Shadow's Awakening can very much be enjoyed and appreciated without having played the previous entries and, by all accounts, seems to be the best one in the series anyway. Taking place in the fantasy world of Heretic Kingdoms, the game starts with you controlling a demon named the Devourer as he is summoned from the Shadow Realm by a mysterious hooded man voiced by none other than Tom Baker of Doctor Who fame. At this point, the hooded man instructs you, the Devourer, to select one of three already dead heroes to resurrect, then possess. This will be your starting class essentially, although that does switch up quite a bit further down the line, but we'll discuss that more in a moment. Each of the three starting heroes you can choose from come with their own strengths and abilities and also their own storylines. Once selected, the newly resurrected hero and the devourer are then sent on a mission to stop a new wave of demonic forces and activity threatening to take over the heretic kingdoms. Story-wise, it's kind of your standard fantasy fable, really. The game doesn't really add anything new to the genre in that sense, but it does have a pretty decent writing and the voice acting is also of a surprisingly high standard. Thanks mostly to Tom Baker, who brings years of acting and voice acting experience to the table, which is clearly evident. Our only hope lies in partnership, which is precisely why I have summoned you here, demon. Gameplay is instantly enjoyable, especially if you already like these kind of RPGs, but in fairness to it, it also brings its own unique twist on the genre too, with some pretty smart additional mechanics. It's not all just about grinding for better loot and spending an ungodly amount of hours in menus as is quite common with games in this genre. The main hook, or gimmick if you will, is that you control characters operating in two separate planes of existence. The Devourer operates in the Shadow Realm, which inhabits ghouls, demons and all sorts of ill-fated creatures that you will need to fight and kill, as well as containing its own unique loot and upgrade materials. While the hero you chose at the beginning operates in the real world and can interact and communicate with the inhabitants within it, gaining access to side quests, buying from merchants and completing puzzles etc. Switching between them is done in an instant by pressing the shoulder buttons. This is key and you'll be switching them up constantly as it's not only vital to defeat some enemies and gain access to areas the hero can't venture, but it also means every area you come across can be combed over and looted twice, giving you double for your money in terms of exploration. Where it gets really interesting however is that you can have up to three heroes, or puppets as they're called in game, in your party at once and can all be tagged in and out whenever and whatever the situation calls for, essentially giving you access to four separate classes to play as at once. For me, this was a fantastic little dungeon crawler that provided some very unique gameplay mechanics that were easy to comprehend and immediately get to grips with and enjoy. If you like your top-down action RPGs and haven't played this yet, then I highly recommend it, especially as physical copies for it on console can still be easily found for very low prices, both new and used. For three years, I have been hiding here amid the detritus of the heretic kingdoms. But it is only a matter of time before my former allies locate me. And I am running out of places to hide. Whew. 
close call. Not shy of a video game adaptation, over the years there's been numerous entries in the Transformers series that have appeared over the course of many console generations. But what sets Transformers Battlegrounds apart is that, at least to my knowledge, it's the first to feature turn-based tactical gameplay. Being a sucker for games within that genre and having grown up with those cheeky robots in disguise, I was pretty hyped to finally try this game out and I'm pleased to say that it works really well. Story-wise it's pretty low-key but it is competently written and the voice acting is delivered well too. It's based off of the new animated series I believe and coming from an OG Gen 1 fan over here I must admit it lacks the gravelly rumble the original voice cast had but still works decent enough. Starscream is still a screeching wreck at least which was nice. What? The city's conquered! I should be with the fleet! Playing out as a squad based tactical game set on a grid it comes with the staple mechanics of the genre like using your surroundings as cover, selecting attack or defend when it's your go etc with abilities like overwatch, AoE attacks and party healing all making an appearance. But where it gets interesting is discovering your party's own unique special abilities and utilising them in the best way possible to achieve your objectives. These objectives or missions are pretty much limited to either destroy everything in sight or reach an extraction point without having to destroy everything in sight. With each character having three action points to use each turn to either move or attack etc, the game does a decent job at communicating what your options are and how effective they will be, allowing you to scan across your whole party before any concrete decisions are made. Defeating enemies and completing levels grants you spark points which can be used to level up your Autobots and unlock new devastating abilities in Wheeljack's lab. Although I must say it would have been nice to see the damage output of each new ability and not just a brief description of what it does, so that more informed choices could be made. But then again this is a very watered down RPG system to be quite honest with you and never presented itself as anything more robust than that. It's not the prettiest game on this list, not by a long shot. It would have benefited massively from having a more polished look and feel. The ultimate attacks for example should be these big bombastic and rare attack animations and instead they just kind of stutter and whimper through the battlefield. Dealing heavy damage yes but they don't exactly leave a lasting impression. You can definitely tell this game was made on a budget which is surprising considering the IP they were able to secure for use. It doesn't do anything particularly unique and if you're a fan of the genre like myself you might even think it's a little simplistic. But I think that's where this game actually shines. It's a very easy going time that works as a fantastic entry point into turn based tactical games. Particularly for anyone unaccustomed or even for someone wanting to introduce a younger person to the genre. I think this sits well alongside other greats in that niche like Mario Rabbids Kingdom Battle for example. A great tactical podcast game that doesn't grind the brain cogs to a halt and a title you can still find really cheap so it won't break the bank adding it to your collection either. Definitely worth considering. Bumblebee. After countless cycles, it's mine. Enough. What? The Allspark! It speaks! No, Megatron. I am Optimus Prime. Come on, come on. Where are the others? Where's the rest of the Resistance? Uh, I don't know. Ah! Ah! No! No, no! no! Ah! Terminator Resistance is a first-person shooter set during the original Future War depicted in the first two Terminator movies and was released on PS4, Xbox One and PC in 2019. An enhanced version of the game was released a few years later for current-gen consoles too. Taking place in the now infamous setting of a post-apocalyptic LA, the year is 2028 and the machines have made their move, annihilating the landscape and anything within it that happens to have a pulse. You'll take the role of Jacob Rivers, a soldier from the Resistance against Skynet's army of killer tin cans. Story-wise, it's a great addition to the world set up by the first two movies, featuring characters and recognisable names from the franchise's history. You'll also get some player choice in terms of what direction the narrative goes into, with multiple choice answers presented to you when conversing with NPCs. 
all feeding into which ending you will eventually see. A first person shooter first and foremost, but it does emphasize the use of stealth and tactics and even survival elements. The world is harsh, barren and bleak. The enemy humanity is up against is emotionless and clinical in its approach to eradicating the last few survivors. So picking your battles wisely is of the utmost importance if you want to survive and progress through the game. Weapons start off standard enough with pistols, light machine guns and semi-automatic rifles etc, but more exciting firepower becomes available to you as you play on. The ammo for these weapons however are a much rarer scarcity. Quite a few times I've found myself getting an enemy's health down to a slither only to then run out of bullets, having to retreat from the fight and scavenge for more before returning to finish the job. Thankfully it's not just down to the blind luck of stumbling across ammo caches out in the world, as you can also craft your own along with medkits and lockpicks at workbenches located in safe houses you find scattered around battlefields, with the ability to craft more diverse items as the game progresses. It's not open world, but the segmented areas you do get to explore and fight within are large and well designed, so there are plenty of places to hide and scavenge for loot. There's also a base of operations where the small crew of survivors that have banded together can get a moment's peace and prepare for the next excursion. There's a critical path for the main story with side missions to engage with too that, while optional, are worthy of considering as they not only provide more opportunity to gather resources, but also grant more experience points that you can use to level up Jacob's abilities. You can focus on maximizing damage output or dump a load of points into stealth so that you can stay relatively unseen from the glowing red eyes of the Terminators. I would also like to add that the lockpicking skill is well worth considering in this game as the loot found behind locked doors is usually the good stuff. It's got a great sense of atmosphere and foreboding that gets under your skin and keeps you on your toes throughout, which genuinely surprised me. I thought this was going to be a much more, you know, shooty shooty bang bang blast your way through type game, but it makes you feel way more vulnerable than that from the jump. Pretty much as soon as it starts you realise this is a much more nuanced than considered affair that will require you to contemplate your options for every scenario, as opposed to just going in guns blazing and hoping for the best. Sound design and the iconic synth heavy soundtrack was also very much on point, as was the overall voice acting of its cast. Honestly, I actually think the end result of this game was of a very high standard, even before the enhancements you get with the updated version for current consoles. I honestly can't believe it got such low scores from reviewers when it was released. Check this game out when you get the chance, it's way better than the critics would leave you to believe. Once upon a time, Amadeus the wizard was waking up in a cottage high up in the mountains. He was far, far away from home, attending a wizarding conference with his fellow wizards. And that morning, he decided a trip to the mailbox was in order, even if this box was located at a very inconvenient distance. Time to find that mailbox. So next up I want to talk about the massively underrated Trine Ultimate Collection. Okay, so this is a bit of a cheat as technically it's four games in one, so for today's purposes at least I will just be discussing Trine 4 The Nightmare Prince. In its story we follow the titular Nightmare Prince, Prince Celius, who happens to have an aptitude for magic. Biting off more than he can chew, he misuses his father's spellbook, releasing the shadow of his soul and destroying his family's castle. Furious, his parents send him away to the Astral Academy, but the Academy wizards are unable to control the prince or his newly discovered magic. With the prince eventually finding an opportunity to escape, the Academy's headmaster then tasks three heroes, Amadeus the Wizard, Pontius the Knight and Zoya the Thief, with finding and retrieving Prince Celius before his unstable nightmare magic causes irreversible damage. It's essentially a 2D platformer with a focus on physics puzzles and light combat. What's unique about it is that you'll be playing as three separate characters at once, switching between them on the fly at the push of a button. Amadeus the Wizard can use telekinesis to levitate certain objects in the world, 
and can also conjure boxes at will to allow the party to access previously unreachable areas. Zoya the Thief can fire elemental arrows that not only aids in combat segments but can, for example, freeze a perpetually moving platform in order to cross a gap too wide to jump. She can also tether ropes to objects creating a slackline bridge and can use the same rope to swing through the environment. And finally there's Pontius the Knight, a rotund, jolly fellow equipped with a shield and a sword that he's not afraid to use, and a devastating stomp that can break weak floors. Pontius is your first line of defence in battle sections of the game, but his shield can also be utilised to deflect projectiles or reflect light in puzzle scenarios. Dictated by the current situation you might find yourself in, switching between the characters as and when is done easily with the press of one of the shoulder buttons and happens pretty much instantly. Or you can have a friend jump in and play alongside you in couch co-op, you've got options. To be honest, I can take or leave the combat in this game. I appreciate it's there to break the gameplay up and it's not inherently bad or anything, but I am definitely here for the puzzles as they're just so good. Incredibly well designed that increase in difficulty at just the right pace, getting to know each of the characters' abilities inside and out and understanding what they are capable of achieving is key to solving most of the puzzles. None ever felt obtuse and whenever I did hit a roadblock it was usually down to me neglecting one of the hero's abilities rather than the game hiding the answer from me. The Try and Ultimate collection is a fantastic collection of puzzle games that rarely misses the mark. Well, maybe Try and 3 did, but we don't talk about that. I picked this collection up thinking the series was done, but they did just recently release Try and 5, which I haven't had a chance to play yet, but from all accounts seems to be the best in the series so far, so who knows when they will eventually stop making them. This particular Try and collection, however, is a great place to start and incredible value for money. A must for any fans of puzzle platformers. You must be the prince we're looking for. Good thing too. I was afraid you'd been eaten by wolves. What do you want with me? We're taking you to the safety of the Astral Academy. What? I'm not going back there. You think we'd leave you alone in the middle of nowhere here? Look, I don't care if you're a prince or a pig keeper. You're coming with us. I'm not a child to be told what to do. Not again. Stop for a pint, did you? The Order 1886 was a PS4 exclusive that launched in 2015 and is considered by many as Sony's first true flop of the generation. As a result, it's ended up a fairly forgotten entry into an otherwise stellar catalogue of exclusive games from that console. Intended to be the first of a new franchise, Sony's unceremonious axing of the project entirely indicates they would rather it stay forgotten for good. In this fictionalised version of London in 1886, an order of knights keeps the world safe from half-breed monsters a combination of animal and human that originated from around the 7th century AD. At that time, a small number of humans took on bestial qualities and traits. With the rest of humanity fearing them, war broke out. King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table realise they're fighting a losing battle with the stronger and more aggressive half-breeds. But through a mysterious turn of fate, discovers black water, a mystical liquid that significantly extends lifespans and contains healing properties. However, despite this advantage, the humans still lose battle after battle. That is until the Industrial Revolution finally turns the tide. In this alternate timeline, the Order of Knights is still intact and their goal remains the same, but engineers are far more advanced, inventing tech such as thermal imaging, rail guns, giant zeppelins and even wireless communication. The game starts with you playing as Sir Galahad in a London plagued by both attacks from half-breeds and a rising anti-government insurgency. 
not to mention the exploits of a certain Jack the Ripper murdering his way through the streets of East London. With a sneaking suspicion that the half-breeds are in cahoots with the rebels, Galahad and his knights are sent on a secret mission to investigate. The story is great and the intrigue and twisting plot keeps you guessing constantly. Developed by Ready at Dawn, mostly famous for creating the two well-respected God of War games on PSP, Chains of Olympus and Ghost of Sparta, the hype for The Order 1886 was monumental. I mean, it really was extremely anticipated at the time of release, not least because it looked so good in trailers, but also because there genuinely wasn't all that many first-party exclusives at the time. Unfortunately, the hype train crashed and burned when it released as reviewers and players alike panned it for being too short and the gameplay too simplistic. And while I don't disagree with those statements, I don't resent the game for them either. If you think of this game more of a Quantic Dream type game than a Naughty Dog experience, you'll probably be a lot less disappointed. What was undeniable and did live up to the hype, however, were the technical achievements in its presentation. The character models still look impressive today, and the world design of an alternate 19th century London was and still is fantastic. Its dark and gothic presentation holds so much detail, from the rundown back alleys of Whitechapel to the meticulous gadgets and weaponry that a certain Mr. Tesla develops for the team. Even the costumes are so well thought out and designed, it's impossible not to stop and take a moment and just appreciate how pretty things look in this game. With a massive focus on narrative, the fact that gameplay took a hit in favour of a rich and well told story never bothered me. There are faults in this game, yes, the overabundance of tips and prompts definitely shows that it's a product of its time and some might not like just how much exposition and cutscenes break up the gunplay. Also the constant use of quick time events might immediately turn some people off too, but none of these things ultimately bothered me or stopped me from having a blast with this game. I personally think the hate it got is way overblown. Is it as good as other first party offerings from that generation? No, not really, but it certainly isn't as bad as people would make you believe. I honestly can't understand it's just been left to rot. In my opinion, it's definitely worth revisiting and developing more games for. Taking the ideas further and rectifying some of the mistakes made in the original would be awesome. A hugely underrated first party title that more people should play before listening to the naysayers. Everyone stand back. Igniting! Save your prayers, Lafayette. There is no God to help him. Come on. Let's go. And there you have it, guys. Another five massively underrated games to consider checking out. Let me know down in the comments if you guys have picked any of these up yet and what your thoughts are about playing them. If you're new to the channel and appreciated the content, then have a think about hitting the like button as it genuinely helps out quite a bit and hit the subscribe button to keep updated. The next video will be focusing on games from the PS3, but until then, thanks for watching, and as always, take care, be good, and game on.